Good evening. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight to uh, the January 16th, 2020 school committee meeting. Um, our chair, Mr. Robinson, is not here this evening, so he's asked me to chair the meeting. Um, I will start, as we always do, by calling for public comment. Just to be clear, tonight's main business is around the FY21 budget. We're focusing on the regular day and special education cost center. So if you came with comments about those, I'm going to ask that you hold them till we get to that part of the agenda. Public comment is for items not on the agenda. So if anybody is here tonight to speak to something other than the regular day or special education cost centers of the FY21 budget, this is the time to raise your hand and let me know you have something to say. Seeing none, uh, I'm going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, did anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda this evening? Okay. So move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. That was a second from Ms. Callie. All those in favor? Or zero. Um, before we get into our main item tonight, we are going to do reports. I don't believe we have a student report this evening. Dr. Doherty, I'll turn it over to you and your staff for any reports. Do you want me to say something? Sure. So the one item we did want to let. Mike. Here we go again. <laughs> Inside versus outside voice. I have to move them. So one item we did want to make sure that the committee is aware, and I believe um, an email was sent out, is that Tuesday night at the select board meeting, the town manager will be giving a brief update on the security project. So we are inviting all of the elected boards to attend that meeting to obtain the updates. We had been doing the updates at school committee meetings, so this time we're going to do one at the select board meeting. So we wanted to make sure anyone interested in attending had that on their calendars and their meetings start at seven and we're one of the first agenda items. And we are posted. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything, Chris? Okay. I have two items that I wanted to share. Uh, so uh, last evening, we had our kickoff meeting of the Portrait of the Graduate uh, design team, uh, which uh, Ms. Boynton and I are um, co-facilitating. We have 21, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 29 um, members of the team, which include educators, community members, and students. And we're probably going to increase that number because we want to get more students involved. Uh, as always, our students are always so busy that it's, it's difficult to get a group of students to be a part of, of activities that are happening at this time, you know, the times of the, when the meetings are. So we're in the process of recruiting more students. But I wanted to let you know with the meeting, uh, it was a very good way to start it. We um, did a few articles uh, that focused on the direction that uh, our, our students may be facing down the road and the types of skills and dispositions they may have they may have to have um, we also saw the um, trailer of the video most likely to succeed which is uh, a movie that was uh, created by Ted Dintersmith um, and that is gonna we're gonna do a community showing in February on that and we're actually doing a staff showing tomorrow uh, with that movie as, as part of this process, also, we, we showed some of the examples that other districts did uh, when they did the process of Portrait of the Graduate. Um, and we just had good conversations as we start to gel as a, as a team. So the meeting lasted about 90 minutes. It was a very productive kickoff to, um, to where we're going. Tomorrow... Uh, is an early release day for our students. It's an 11 o'clock dismissal. Uh, staff will be congregating in the Performing Arts Center at noontime, uh, teachers and paraeducators, and uh, we are going to be showing the entire movie most likely to succeed. And then we'll be doing breaking out into vertical team groups, which are going to be facilitated by administrators and recorders. are going to also be administrators and teachers. Um, and basically, we're going to be asking three questions. Um, first question is, what are the hopes, aspirations, and dreams that our community has for our young people? The second is, what are the skills and habits of mind that our children need for success in this rapidly changing and complex world? 
And then the third is what are the implications for the learning experiences we provide in our school systems. So that will be the first round of data collecting for our staff. We'll be doing a very similar exercise with the community. And then it, the purpose of the design team is to take all of this data and look for themes, go back to the community, go back to the staff, um, get more feedback and input, and start to narrow it down to a few of these habits of mind where the timeline right now is that in the early fall, we will come to the school committee for their uh, approval of that. So we're very excited about this. It's going to help uh, guide us uh, in for future conversations uh, in direction for our school district. So that, that's my first report. My second report is, and I know you received this email from MASC, but uh, regarding the Student Opportunity Act, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the email I received from the commissioner regarding the Student Opportunity Act and the guidance that we're receiving for the um, Student Opportunity Act plans, which are due April 1st. So next Thursday, I will be attending um, a uh, conference day where the commissioner is going to speak uh, on this topic. And they're going to have a bifurcated approach to this process. So right now they've told us do not do anything yet, but it's coming. And so there is going to be a template that's going to be designed based on the amount of additional Chapter 70 money you are receiving. So if you're receiving a lot of Chapter 70, additional Chapter 70 money, um, your plan is going to be a little bit more detailed, complex to complete. For those that are receiving much less, which Reading is one of those, um, it will be a much simpler form um, to use. Eventually, this plan, once I receive the information uh, and we complete it and we get the feedback necessary, um, is going to be uh, approved by the school committee. The tricky part with, with Reading, and we are a little bit unique with this, is that our Chapter 70 funding does not come directly to the schools. It goes to the general town fund, and then all of the general town fund revenue is split 64-36. So it, it's going to be a little bit challenging to identify exactly how much we will be getting and what, what's going to be additional. So that's something, obviously, that we're going to have to work with Desi on um, as, we, as we move forward. But I will have much more detail uh, probably next Thursday um, on this so I'll be more than happy to report out once I find out. Thank you. That was it, Dr. Doherty? That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, any reports from Ms. Tice? Ms. Tice, do you want to have anything? Yes, I asked. Sorry. I'm <laughs> it's so okay. sorry, I missed it. I do. If... Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I was um, really excited to attend the GAP Fair, GAP Program Fair last Sunday. I got there for a little bit. Um, and it was very exciting. There were over 140 people that came to see what kinds of programs were, are offered as alternatives to going directly on to college or as a break in between if you start off at college and you want to do something else um, that uses your time wisely to figure out how to focus or get ready um, for the next steps in your life. There were 47 exhibitors. There were all different types of exhibits that were um, programs that were exhibited there from anything from nautical kinds of skills to foreign country skills to living with families to doing internships. It was, um, there were so many opportunities there really to sort of stimulate the imagination about what you could be doing as opposed to being in a race to nowhere or somewhere. Just taking the time to figure out what you want to do for your life. And uh, many thanks for our guidance staff who arranged this and were there on a Sunday to man it. Linda Williams was there from beginning to end. Um, and um, I look forward to more. This was the first time. So um, I hope that families that couldn't go check out the guidance department. They'll still have literature and information on how to learn more. 
Um, I also, mm -hmm. two very quick reports. I was really fortunate to be able to go to um, a PTO workshop last night that um, was focused on how to look at children's books with an eye toward equity and anti-bias. Anti and there were many other, um, there were people from all the schools there. There were administrators and teachers from the schools. It was um, given by Julia Hendricks, the principal, Paula Falvey, librarian, and Jan Rain, the literary specialist. And they had a whole lot of books out there and framed the question, I notice blank in a book and I wonder. And so they sort of gave us the tools to look at a book and unpackage what might be in the book and not necessarily not, not um, leave out the book with reading with our children, but to use it as a discussion point so that um, you can learn together and tackle some pretty heavy topics about um, equity and anti-bias. And the second program I was able to go to, the kids shown, um, that was at Birch Meadow Tuesday morning where there was an all school assembly led by fourth graders um, of the student council. And they're doing these regular assemblies, um, important contributors of the world. And this one was about sports. And the children pick out who they want to research and what about them makes them a good role model. And it was really exciting to see what they picked out in terms of the school's core values um, and also the process because there were, I w my guess is there were about seven children that were supposed to present and three were out sick. And the other four were able to pick up and pick up what, where the others left off. They were able to read what the other children had written and present that. And the confidence they exuded was really um, moving and it spoke so powerfully about what's going on in our schools. And there are posters of each of the athletes that they highlighted. One of them was the um, fencing person that they meet through understanding disabilities, Molly Sullivan Sliney. And others were Julian Edelman and there was a speed skater, but people some of whom are on the tip of your tongue and others that I never heard of. So kudos to these kids for picking them out. And they'll have a month of looking at these posters in their school to learn about them and see their faces and notice the diversity of all the people who are making our world a better place and role models. So, um, and I have to recommend going and hearing them sing the school song together. And I know this happens at I think all of the schools, but the pledge is it really is moving to see our kids and our teachers and our administrators in action. It's nothing like it. So thank you and thanks for the opportunity to be able to go. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Wise? All right, I just have one quick report. Um, two evenings ago, right here, the um, Special Education Parent Advisory Council met. The main agenda item was a presentation from Leslie Leslie from the Federation for Children with Special Needs. Um, and the topic of her presentation was the role of the CPAC. It was very foundational. Um, she sort of gave information to our new CPAC board about how they can best define their mission and how they can best achieve that mission. So it was really um, well attended and really good presentation and there were a lot of um, RPS administrators in the room too, which I really appreciated that yet one more evening meeting and they're here. So um, it was it was fantastic. The CP, uh, the CPAC has two upcoming meetings just to make people aware of on Tuesday, February 11th. Um, at 7 p.m. here, there's a basic rights workshop. This is a really good workshop for any parent who is new to special education, new to the IEP process. Also really good if you're a parent who thinks your child might need an IEP and you wanna learn about the process. Also a great presentation for any parent who's maybe been in, in, in special education for a little while and just wants a refresher um, on their basic rights as parents. So that will be Tuesday, February 11th at 7 p.m. here. Um, and the CPAC is trying something, I think it's new this year, they're going to have a morning meeting just to see if that is better for some parents to attend. So on Wednesday, February 26th at 10 a.m., they will be having um, their monthly business meeting at the Reading Public Library. Um, and all this information is on their website. So that is it. Um, with that, I think it's time to turn over 
um, to turn this over to Dr. Doherty and his staff for our main agenda item, which, as I said, is continuation of our discussion of the FY21 school budget tonight, focusing on our two biggest cost centers, regular day and special education. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank uh, all of the administrators, um, team chairs, assistant principals, uh, principals, uh, directors for being here this evening. Really appreciate um, your presence here. Um, what we want to do this evening is, as Ms. Borowski said, is to talk about the two largest cost centers, the regular day cost center and the special education cost center. Uh, Mrs. Kelly will be presenting the regular day cost center, and Dr. Stice will be presenting the special education cost center. So uh, at this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over the regular day portion to uh, Mrs. Kelly. Hi. Good evening. Uh, and thank you again. I, I, I echo uh, John's statements about thanking everyone for being here. Um, the regular day cost center is, frankly, uh, the major part of our budget. It's over 50% of our budget. Um, and a lot of the folks sitting in this room today are the leaders that help lead this department. Um, these are not special ed costs, which I know Jen um, Stice will be talking about later. These are lots of different things that go into this cost center. Um, we have a little bullet here, a big bullet actually explaining it, but it's really basically principals, assistant principals, um, regular education teachers, specialists, that could, that means art, music, PE, reading, um, librarians, really anybody who's not related specifically for special education. Um, administrative assistants, regular education paraeducators, um, tutors, folks that help out in the lunchroom, any of those things, um, as well as the curriculum coordinators and what I call my team. Um, it, it also, um, there are also, what does it say here? It should be noted that non-represented staff placeholders in the budgets are not actual salaries. So I think we've already covered that, that although we budget for that, um, the teacher's contract, the para's contract, the secretary's contract, they all go on for another year, so we already know what those costs will be. Um, any of the ones that don't already have agreements um, are, are based on experience, uh, performance, um, and I know John is, is meeting regularly with all of uh, the administrative staff and I'm meeting with all of my staff, so um, that's really how we do that. It also includes transportation, um, and for our transportation, this is not special ed transportation. This is our uh, buses that bus any K-6 to students that are over two miles, um, as well as homeless. We don't have a huge homeless population, but I'm sure uh, you're aware, but I, I, hopefully the Reading public is aware that the McKinney-Vento Act requires us to transport um, kiddos that may not currently be living in Reading, but their last permanent address were in Reading. And that act was really put into place so that um, homeless students who typically move from district to district, they may live with an aunt for a while or in transitional housing. What they found is some of those kids, and I, I certainly lived it in other communities as an administrator, where they may have eight different homes in a year um, and moving around all the time. So the McKinney-Vento Act basically says until, until you have permanent housing, you have the right to stay in your last resident housing. We have a very small population um, that, that do require transportation, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it's pretty costly because if we're if we're picking up somebody in another town and bringing them here every day that's really a single transportation um, also we do have as you know uh, tuition based busing um, but our our costs are expensive our membership our ridership is down a little bit um, we you know we haven't started the bus process yet um, but we'll be looking at that carefully but that comes out of this budget anything that is not um, comes in as fees we, we pay the difference. Um, and also, uh, with full day kindergarten, the last bullet is that we, as you know, our full day kindergarten is a tuition based program, and we do take an offset um, out of that, and we're increasing the offset a bit. And that covers lots of different things. I know Gail did a nice job of explaining that at a previous meeting, and I've heard her explain it in other meetings as well um, that those offsets pay for. Um, the additional staffing that's required, a portion of administration, a portion of support personnel that are all utilized during extended day. 
So uh, I'm going to continue on. If, if you want, if you have questions, I know we typically say wait till the end, but each thing is sort of specific. So if you have questions along the way, I think for my for my mind, it's better if we stop along the way. Are there questions before we go on to the next one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm raising my hand. Someone should call on me, <laughs> Dr. Doxer. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, do we have a sense? I know you use the adjective expensive tuition based busing. Mm -hmm. um, so is that the reason that our, um, our usage is down? Or do we have a sense of why? So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it, it fluctuates. I don't have a historical sense of how many people pay the fees uh, to ride the bus. You know, parents in Reading are, are, are allowed to do that if that works for them. We have bus stops in various places across town. Um, I think Linda um, Engelson will send something out. We'll, we'll get a sense of that. Um, I don't believe our rates have gone up. I, okay. I think we've, no, we've kept the them. No, transportation rates have not gone up. Right. We've just seen over the past couple of years slight dips in the yeah. ridership, but we still have the second paid bus. It just does not pay for itself. So <coughs> the decrease in students, the budget absorbs the cost. And I, I, I wonder if Late Start has something to do with that as well. Um, if you're dropping your child off at Birch or Coolidge and then you're just kind of heading up to the high school, it could be the parents are like, well, I was going to have my high school student take the bus, but now I'm in the car anyway. So I don't know. Thank you. And second question. Second question um, is about the full day kindergarten. I have in my mind that I'm hoping that at some point we'll be able to go to mm -hmm. free full day kindergarten. Does using the offset, um, I know at some point, so it says an increase in the full day kindergarten tuition, it's a mouthful, the offset, mm -hmm. um, we're increasing the use. Does that impact how hard it, it will be for us to withdraw from that down the road for the full day, or is it just a separate process. So, I mean, I've heard the number, and, and Gail can correct me, I think it, it's 1.2 million it would cost for us to go to full day. That, uh, it doesn't, you know, that money has to go somewhere, Linda. So we collect, you know, our tuition, and then we use it in various ways. It is all really important. Um, if we were to take it from other places, it would have to come out of somewhere. Um, so, so we should be one, using this while we, we have We should be this. using it where it is and, and, and using it so that we can continue to fund my curriculum items or yeah. whatever. Yes. But the reality is that the $1.2 million would have to come out of a lot of different buckets to make up that difference. Um, and, and there would be significant cuts for a, a budget this size. But I, but I agree. I love full-day kindergarten. Um, I have a quick question on the... the it's kind of aligned with what Dr. Doxer just asked. If we're seeing a decrease in ridership, and I understand the operating budget absorbs that, is there sort of a breaking point where we need to look at the fees? If, if we were to charge just the riders, my sense would be it would be prohibitive. Okay. okay. And we, have, we, we do have kids that are over the two-mile mark, so we are... You're running the bus. We're running anyway. the buses anyway. Gotcha. We try to fill the extra seats, um, but it doesn't... Right? And this is a separate paid bus that we run. Oh, a separate. Yeah. We have two. Correct. And we, in order to do it, it would, my sense would be it would be right. very prohibitive to charge bus costs the are very expensive. cost of the bus to okay. just the paying base. And I know it's, that I there was. I think we calculated. So it's currently $450. $1,000. It's $450 currently. But yeah. it would be over $1,000 if we, if it was strictly tuition based. And that's assuming all the same riders, all the riders would right. stay. And Which, that would go up every year as the cost of the bus. Okay, so at this point, it's just a trend to keep an eye on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the next slide, although it looks like some sort of small bullets, it's a, it's a big um, chunk of the budget. Um, one of the things that as I was thinking about talking tonight, I was, ta I was thinking about, you know, what are, what's, what's curriculum and, and what are the costs that we do. Um, so wh when I think of the curriculum work that we, we're doing in Reading, it's, it's multi-tiered, right? So some of it are a lot of these new state frameworks and our implementation or state regulations, state guidelines. So some of that and a big part of that, of our budget is that. Um, we also want to protect budget to continue our professional learning. 
and our work around really um, working with our staff on their prep work and their planning work. So, for instance, um, in the elementary schools, our um, coordinators have been meeting with them on Wednesdays, and that's really they're working on mostly that language of professional learning and what do you need to be better at prepping and planning. And then we do have other curriculum groups that meet as well, but it sort of all works together, if you think of it in sort of a secular way. Um, we are also working with the PD committee to develop a professional development plan, which I, we will present later this spring. Um, but that'll really outline what we're looking at in the next three years, not knowing where the state's heading from, from that. Uh, the big, and this is in um, my learning and teaching newsletter went out today and there's some updates in that but <clears throat> the state has some fairly major curriculum work in the works so just so you know and it does impact some of our budgets of course last year our social study standards uh, were updated and pretty significant changes swinging changes and I'm calling it a three-year plan we're currently in year one next year will be year two and the following um, will be year three. We really have to break it up in three years, not just because of budgets. You know, if, if you folks said, hey, Chris, we're going to give you more money, we'll just do it. We don't have the bandwidth to do that kind of sweeping changes pre-K to 12 in, in, a, in a short cycle. I know the state really wants us to, um, but most districts are doing what we're doing, and they're chunking it out. So this year, we've spent most of our um, energy, time, and resources with middle school materials. We will continue to buy some more civics materials. I mentioned this at the last meeting as they become available. Um, but we are continuing to meet with them and discuss that. We're, we're sending people to some conferences. We're at a lot of the state DESE uh, meetings about that. We are also, we're just starting an elementary steering committee and curriculum. So our plan is to have that ready to go July 1st so that we can update our curriculum materials in elementary school next year and we also concurrently have a ninth grade social studies uh, group that's already meeting um, the good news is that our high school social studies curriculum is already an integrated model which most districts do not do an integrated model and what they mean by integrated model is world and US are like this most schools do world and US separately um, the new standards have them integrated we already did that um, Reading was actually one of the districts they looked at when they rewrote the standards so that doesn't mean we don't have some changes uh, the eighth grade civics unit did take a portion of our um, ninth grade curriculum so we're looking at that the exciting thing is and I don't this is going back in the dark ages when I was in school but when we did um, US history we often didn't get through everything it was like World War two and then done because like you ran out of time what's nice about this is that we're sort of moving up the calendar um, so I think it starts considerably later than it had. So the high school teachers are feeling really good about that. Um, the high school will also have a project. I know we've talked at this group uh, before about the eighth grade civics project, which we're um, piloting this year. The high school will also be piloting a project. I'm not sure, we haven't decided where it's gonna fit in, if it's gonna be 9th, 10th, 11th. Um, in the past, we always did um, the, the um, what is it called, world? Uh, what did they do in history? What was that called? The project that they did. Of oh, real problems? No, 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 no. It'll come to me. Um, they used to do, um, the, and they would compete. Well, I forget what it's called, but uh, that was done Something in tenth made. grade. They used to do it years ago, and they stopped doing it. Um, what was history day? History day. National history yeah. day. <laughs> I should know because my daughter participated in it, but I, I couldn't think of it. So I, I think we're looking at a mini national history day <gasps> model. Um, that's what most schools are doing, um, and I know the eighth grade, the civics project. Kate and I have started to talk about how does this dovetail a little bit with this portrait of the graduate and service learning. So there could be more to come on that, but we're starting to look at that. So as far as we're hoping that we'll be ready to hit the ground running, well, we will be in ninth grade, put a team together for 10th grade and 11th grade will be done next year. And then we'll budget for that for the following year. So if that makes sense, at the end of fiscal 2022, we should be all set for social studies. Um, concurrently, um, 
World Language is going to be uh, publishing. It, it, we're calling it World Language now. Um, the state has asked us to not use foreign language anymore. They are in the process of drafting new standards. They are going to be drafted and vetted and um, receive information from stakeholders, and they will be published next January. So. Uh, I know I have it in our budget book that we're looking at some funding for that. I don't know how far we'll get into that. Um, I do know that our world language department has not had a lot of curriculum updates um, in recent times. So um, definitely not since John was the assistant superintendent. So, um, so we're looking at that and we're looking at that 7 to 12 model rather than just really looking at, at um, the just so you know, and I'm just going to say it, uh, the state is actually recommending that world language start much younger than seven. So uh, that's going to be the new um, state that was very clear. I went to a, a workshop on that last week. Um, so um, I'm on the next slide. Additionally, we've talked a lot about math. Um, and Ke Gail and I were just talking about this of like, why are all these curriculum updates coming at the same time? I think a lot of it has to do with flash going away. Uh, a lot of companies are re sort of uh, branding all of their curriculum materials. If they used any online resources that involve flash, they're not updating them, they're not continuing with them. Pearson is one of them. So we were lucky enough to have um, a really good deal with Pearson um, the last number of years with both our seven and eight materials as well as our Algebra One materials. The seven, eight materials are going away and we actually have had a team meeting all year uh, led by Heather Leonard and working with the middle school principals and middle school teams um, and we should have a, a plan and an order in this calendar year for new materials in seven and eight. Um, the Algebra One is also in the same situation. So uh, we are putting together a team. Allison um, Williams, who's the department head, um, is working with Kate and I, and she's putting a team together to look at programs, to look at different options. Uh, we'll go through the exact same process. We'll look at what do teachers want. We've already done a survey with them, so we know what they're looking for. And then we'll look at, uh, we've developed a district rubric that we use that's based on the Ed Reports model um, that looks at different variations. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So those are kind of the big ticket items in the curriculum. Obviously, curriculum covers a whole lot more than that. Um, one of the other things to, to be of note, although not a framework change, but our dyslexia screening um, situation, the state is meeting next week. Um, they have a meeting next week at DESE to give districts some more guidance. The law was enacted. We know that uh, we need to have a dyslexia screening, but they really haven't outlined um, what are they asking us to do? Obviously, we're um, piloting iStation, which we didn't have a choice in picking. We volunteered to be part of um, the, I, uh, the screening committee, basically, at the state level to give feedback. And Josh Wheaton has graciously offered to be a host site, which is a lot more work for our teams there. So we appreciate that. I think the good news is that it's really showed us a lot about these technology. We're doing a lot with that anyway. Um, we, we've been doing more and more online data collecting, um, but also Lisa's team has really been sort of unpacking what they like and what they don't, and they'll be giving really rich feedback to the state. What I can tell you is that most likely this is going to be over $10,000 because we're going to have to do it in five schools. We're probably going to be given guidance about what grade. There's been a lot of talk about K, but we're not sure. Um, so we have some funds sort of in that curriculum line item, but we're not sure how much it's going to cost. I'm hoping it's not tens of thousands of dollars, but most likely with five schools it'll reach our, our $10,000 threshold. So that means we'll have to go through a bidding and procurement process. And most districts, will, all districts will be in the same place. So really the state has to have some guidance on this because if we have to go with the lowest bid on this, we want to make sure it's a decent one. Um, so, you know, we're hoping that DESE will have some feedback loops, um, but they are meeting next week. So we should know more. Um, Allison um, Stryker, Stracker, our humanities coordinator, goes to all of the DESE meetings that are literacy based. So we do have a seat at the table and we do hear exactly what's going, coming up. Um, and Lisa and I are definitely following this pretty closely, um, as are all the elementary principals, because this will impact everyone. Um, 
but I know there were a lot of conversations about I Station. We're certainly not married to I Station. We didn't pick it. Um, you know, there are some other programs out there that are, are, are talking about having a screening material, some that we're familiar with, um, like um, Dibbles or Lexia. So those are companies that we've already worked with. That would be a lot more comfortable from us, our point of view. But again, we need more guidance on what exactly they're looking for. And then, um, unfortunately, because of the bidding process, we may not have a lot. But they're also, they're also going to know that. The, the contracts are going to know that. So hopefully they're, they're well uh, planned for that. So then the, whatever's left in our curriculum line items um, goes to our regular curriculum costs. So those go for um, testing materials that are not special ed related. They go for, so for instance, we're doing a lot of data collection um, around um, math. We do our AMC math and we're um, using Edge Elastic this year to really collect rich data around that. Um, any of the other subscriptions that we use, um, certainly leveled books and, and theme books. We're trying to really focus on as we buy new books uh, and, and deliver them to the schools. This is not the school-based budgets that the principals have, but the, the books that we give them. We try to really look at diverse titles um, as well as titles with a, um, especially in the K to six level, K to five level, uh, books with um, science or social studies themes so that they can be used in multiple ways. Any questions about, I know I spoke a lot about curriculum, so. Dr. Duxer. <laughs> so I'm wondering with the grant that our teachers, um, thank you so much for participating in that. Um, I think the process will be helpful even if it's not yeah. that program that we choose. Is there any kind of discount on the ultimate program that we, <laughs> oh, that you're laughing. So there's no discount for having <laughs> participated. It was a good idea though. Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, and then my other question, and I think I asked this when we were, got the presentation. Um, flags go up for me when I hear dyslexia screener because there are all sorts of disabilities or challenges with that kind of processing and reading. And one of the um, things flagged at the mask conference that I went to was that you don't want to get too narrow a screener because then you might identify some dyslexia tendencies, but you might miss other things that those same students need support with or interventions with. And so I'm just wondering if we're talking about dyslexia screeners, then are we going to have to also invest in the broader screeners or do these screeners take into account? So what I will tell you, Linda, is we already do some screening, obviously not specifically targeted for dyslexic. Um, we're required to do kindergarten screening, which is, you know, a, a generic, you know, are you ready for kindergarten? And it, it really helps us for kids that haven't already been identified that may have unique profiles that we really want to focus on. Um, Jen Stice and um, Kelly Boswick and I have been meeting with the preschool directors to talk about maybe looking at um, benchmarking even our preschool screeners, right? So that we're using ones that are similar, whether we buy something or we create something together, so that we're really having kind of an, a level playing field as we, we go there. Obviously, we use some math screening um, and assessment tools in elementary, all the elementary schools, and we, and we of course use the Fountas and Pinnell work. The kindergarten teachers do a lot of early assessment because they are doing letter formation and decoding and all of those real early literacy skills. Um, in fact, you know, we're, we're starting to peel back those layers of like how much assessing are we doing? Um, but we need enough information so that they know what to teach. <laughs> so that's really, and they do such a great job. Our kindergarten teams are amazing. What I can tell you is whatever we do purchase, we're going to try to get as much bang out of our buck as we can. So if we go to, like, for instance, if we go to the Lexia model and the dyslexia screening, you know, at DESE says, well, you only have to do this subtest and this subtest, but we're buying a contract that includes 
five subtests, we're going to we're going to have some autonomy around that. I don't really want to mandate. I, I feel like we already do mandate. We have we we've developed in the last year and a half an assessment calendar, pacing guides. I mean, we're working on all of these things in the elementary schools. So I feel like I'd love to give principals autonomy and say, all right, we purchased this. These are the have tos, but you have options here. Um, and it's all that delicate balance of how much assessment do we really want and do we want to assess everyone. So it may be, for instance, if there's a child receiving Title I support or tutoring support that at every six or eight weeks when you're really supposed to check in to see, like, is our intervention working? It could be that we use some of those screeners in that model and say, all right, we did six weeks of intensive targeted um, support there. Let's do one of these extra <coughs> screeners that we already are paying for. Typically, the, the companies aren't like, oh, yeah, we're going to let you do a la carte. You only pay for this. You buy a subscription, and that's, that's what it is. Um, so we, we're going to try to, I mean, as always in Reading, we try to be very econ economical when we make these choices. But the reality is that there is a law that says that we have to specifically look for dyslexia, and it's, it's good practice. I mean, if we have students who have dyslexia, dyslexic um, behaviors already in kindergarten, we know they're not going anywhere. So we, the quicker we get work, working on it, the better. Thank you. Can I ask a question about world language? Of course. Um, I feel like I remember. Thank you for calling it world language. I'm a quick learner. Um, I feel like I recall, I think it was social studies, but I feel like the state had promised new frameworks and the, they kept being delayed. So I'm wondering. So they hired a department. Are you in this so they January they hired a department. They have not had a leader in world language at DESE um, in recent history. Yeah. So uh, the, I forget his name, but he came. I was at a workshop with him last week. He's very dynamic. He he's actually extremely impressive. I mean, he, he showed us the timeline. I mean, they're putting pen to pen paper on this. Usually, when DESE really has like a timeline, a team, a department. It, it's going to happen. You feel good about yeah. it. And, then my and, the, and the standards have never, just so you know, most of our standards that haven't been reviewed and, and changed since 1999, um, world language is one of them. But world languages were never Massachusetts specific. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of them you were using the ATFL, this, the national standards on foreign language. So really, Massachusetts wants to really kind of break out of that and say, all right, we're going to take the best of the ATFL ones and we're going to make our own. My follow-up question to that is, I assume that you're going to do some research and some analysis and look at your options, but I assume you wouldn't commit to a curriculum until you have those frameworks. In for, in world language? Oh no, Good. absolutely no, no, no. We're not doing it. We're not. We will not <laughs> spend one penny until we know exactly what this data is saying, right? And one other thing I wanted to mention is that although not represented in this budget, we do have new arts. Um, standards. So um, Anna Wentland and I have been meeting regularly. Um, most of the arts curriculum is building based. It's a lot of consumables. It's a lot of products, right? Um, we already have a really rigorous and rich art and music department. As you know, it's, it's something that's a hallmark of our district. But there will be some curriculum changes. I don't anticipate there'll be huge budgetary um, concerns around that beyond having the teams meet, maybe beyond the school day. And Ann and I talked about maybe sometime this summer. Now, last year they had some competitive grants to put teams together, and we got some of that grant money to put teams together. They may be, they haven't told us that there is anymore. But um, yet, yeah. but we have some professional development money that if I need to, we will have arts updates and music. Um, and also health. Uh, frameworks are going to be published any minute. Oh, good. So they've already been vetted and they've already had uh, their open sessions. And so we've actually already seen the drafts. Um, and Katie Fiorello, who is our um, department head at the high school, <coughs> and her team, uh, the PE and health teachers, are amazing. And they've already been working on that. And the, um, they've already started swinging to a skills based model, which is what the state is pro proponing, uh, pro <coughs> proposing. And we've been doing that for two years. So um, I don't anticipate, again, major cost with that. But just so you know, I don't want to forget those. Uh, because to me, the, I don't call any of those extracurricular. They're co-curricular. They're super important. Um, and there are some pretty sweeping changes. Mr. Wise. Um, first of all, thank you for the exhaustive summary. Um, looking, I'm looking at the numbers now to go with the, the wordage yep. there. Um, we've seen. <coughs> 
the supplies and materials budget go from 547,000 to 716,000 now to 759,000 in the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, it's page 29 of the budget book for those of you that are following along at home. Um, and figure, here. figure 14 mm -hmm. and here. Um, and I notice in particular that most of that jump seems to be driven by the si by science, which I'm assuming is no atom and the consumables that go with no atom, um, which we, we agreed to a, a long time ago. Um, but I also see some pretty significant jumps in software, and I'm guessing is that where we're putting the money for decoding dyslexia from a software perspective? Or? No, no, that we didn't put it there. Um, the, Gail can help me with this, but a lot of things go into those software budgets. Um, we do have Lexia um, that we use. Um, the main item, the main reason that has increased is we had a decrease in our behavioral coach this year from a 1.0 down to a 0.6. That was based upon discussions with the, the data coach. individual, the data coach, sorry, who approached us. Um, this is she's the Google back Analytics. in school. Yeah, this is the analytics. So we have okay. reduced her hours and we are supplementing that with a couple of um, software packages to help us with the data analytics. So that is about 15,000 of the increase in that line item if we shifted from salaries down there. Okay. Um, and I guess the other. And can I just interrupt yeah. for a second? So, a lot of that, when you talked about the <coughs> no atom, that's all part of the building based budgets. Mm -hmm. um, and the principals do those orders. They work with Heather Leonard on it, but that comes out of the building based supply items. And they, they, they do a great job of really juggling that. Which is where I'm actually going with the question okay. is as we look at these additional curriculum changes, um, and that one was a heavy in renewables curriculum choice. Mm -hmm. Are we considering that as we look at math? Maybe they're less renewable needed needs, mm -hmm. but maybe math could be a workbook or something like that. Are we considering the long-term cost in addition to the first-time cost of the purchase of the curriculum, and how, how do we help in the guidance of that or anything else? So as far as the no atom goes, those consumables aren't actually workbooks for the most part. Materials. They're actual materials. Mm -hmm. And we're really moving to a more pheno phenomena-based um, science which Heather is instructing us on um, and it's really showing kids science through experiments that show that and you need the materials on hand to do that we knew no atom was expensive when we purchased it but we've seen unbelievable results from it um, so it, 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 it's that that you know that the a lot of the software a lot of the stuff that we use day to day have software pieces so I'll give you an example. We purchased National Geographic that came with the online piece for five years. That they, they, they throw it in for that. I, but then after that, if we want to continue with the online piece, it's a subscription-based model. So sometimes those costs are, are factored into that as well. It depends on the grade and the subject. So. Yeah. Okay, so I guess, my, I guess my point there is, or my question, just to clarify it, I understand we made the decision about no atom. I understand it's not in workbooks, but if we, as we look at the math ones, you guys have yeah. looked at the two that are there, and there's there's online, but yeah. I don't know if there's workbooks too. As we look at something with, say, foreign language or world language, world, world yeah. language, correct <laughs> myself, um, there could potentially be something that might have to be in the old days, and maybe it's no longer the case. You would get a workbook that year, and you'd throw it out, and they'd have to go buy new ones. Yeah. So I'm asking, are we? buying stuff that will we think will last or are we buying stuff that we're going to have to recursively buy every single year so i guess that's a blend too um I, and i think what what's really great about reading is that we give a lot of autonomy around that so different schools do different things um some so i'll give you an example some schools might use a notebook for something and some schools might not um some kit some schools use workbooks for certain subjects but not others we don't mandate that they have to buy every work like the no atom workbooks some of them are really required as part of the program and some are optional and it really depends on how they're teaching it we're we're allowing them that autonomy as long as they're still teaching the material so not all of it is replenishable workbooks, is the answer. Okay. I understand that. I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to say, how do we make sure that we don't get into another, and not, not that it's, it's, it's been successful, right? So I'm not having any problems with the fact that it's been successful or not successful, but if we were to go buy, say, a math curriculum that yeah. cost us $100,000 yeah. every year, yeah. we'll do the same thing for, for world language or the same thing for social studies or the same thing for, I'm just trying to make sure that we don't and that is a delicate balance. I think with all the online resources now, um, you know, there are some open source materials that really are free, but then you have to print off everything, right? 
So then your printing costs are way up. So it's, we're constantly looking at all of that. In this particular line item, the reason why it jumped up from last year is because of that analytics platform and um, the Edge Elastic software that we're using to uh, do some math assessments. Um, but as far as it jumping up beyond before that, that is the no atom stuff. So it really, it, it, it looks like a lot of jumping, but it really, it's not. <laughs> I think you bring up a good point, though. It, it's it's pretty rare in education that you can point to an investment yeah. and say that there was a result. But with the science, it does seem, I mean, we put yeah. that in place, and three years later, you saw those science MCAS scores just go off the charts. It was, it, you really did, I don't know what else you would attribute that score jump to. So I think, to your point, identifying ways that we can um, measure the effectiveness of curriculum. And it isn't always MCAS scores. Now, let's say we bought a super expensive math one and everyone said, oh, that's a lot of money. And then you saw that similar jump in MCAS scores. That's a worthy investment. And there may be other ways more than MCAS scores, teacher surveys, Into student our surveys. Own data. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think you bring up a good point that the more expensive the curriculum is, the more I think we have an obligation to measure the efficacy of it. Is that and just, just from a topic point of view, science yeah. is the most heavy consumable yeah. and expensive, yeah, that makes sense. no matter if it's elementary, middle, or high school. Yeah. Right. Um, all of your other subjects are less consumable based. Right. Okay. right. Dr. Just Dr. have to interject there, just to um, emphasize what you said. It's not just scores, Absolutely. it's also the enthusiasm, the passion, <coughs> the catalyst for action that these programs bring out in our children and, and the fun that it is for the teachers to teach it bringing back the energy. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a cohesive process. I think also the um, curriculum coordinator really um, sort of organizing all that and harnessing that and saying, all right, this unit's coming up and this just a reminder of this and make sure you find this materials and um, working really closely with principals to make sure that that happens too. So I, I think, it, I mean, the excitement in science in this district at the elementary level is, is really great, so. I've had the opportunity to see yeah. some no Adam lessons in various elementary schools over the last couple of years, and they are—they're extremely fun for the kids. They're very hands-on, and yeah. So, um, I'm going to pause the discussion here. If anyone in the public has a question at this point, all right. All right. Next slide. <clears throat> So you can see there's not much of a, um, an increase in most of the cost centers, um, except for contract services. Mm -hmm. Most of them are either, like the first one, professional salaries, 2.4, um, clerical salaries, 2.1, and we know that we're going to have cost of living incremental raises there that have already been pre-agreed um, upon. Um, other salaries are paras. Um, we also, it, under the contract services, that includes things like our bus fees. Um, we also allocate some money towards the annual surveys that we do as a district. So we do, we have been doing the pride survey every other year and then YRBS. So this year we will uh, participate in the pride survey. So those funds are in that, um, in that line item. Do you have something else to add with that, Gail? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then just going back, we talked about supplies and materials, um, but also that in, the other expenses include things like the administrative software that we use, Retica, uh, which has an annual renewal rate. Um, we also provide tuition reimbursement as part of our contract um, agreement, um, which is $95,000, um, which is, is indicated in that. Um, we have computer replenishment within that. Um, we also have to renew things um, like our new dashboard that we're using uh, with our analytics software, um, things like Edge Elastic, any of our online things, Lexia. We also, um, as a district, renew our Microsoft uh, suite that we use, um, and that has an annual fee. So all of those things are factored into that. Quick question about supplies and materials. Uh -huh. um, that, as you were describing in the budget book, it breaks it out like by subject and yeah. much more specifically. Um, 
but that includes a lot from the building-based budgets. Is that correct? Absolutely. So you essentially give the principals a certain amount of money per student. So you take the amount of money times the number of students in the building and say, yeah. principals, you, you use this for whatever you need. So if we see a bump in that line item, it's because they took the money they were allotted and said, we need supplies and materials. Right. So I think that's just an important point to make that a, a good chunk of that increase right. is being driven at the principal level, not the district level. Next slide. So this is an overall, it, it really just looks at it, what our FTEs looked like last year and what our FTEs look like this year. And it's pretty similar. Um, I do know that, and Gail just mentioned it, um, the only real change in my department is our instructional coach, um, and it was actually reflected in last year's budget, um, well, this current year's budget, and then it'll be next year, uh, went from a full-time position to a point six. Um, and, and we did that because she spent a large part of her time doing what we're paying this analytics platform to do, uh, assembling the data and then creating spreadsheets and, and graphs so that principals and data teams had that information. Um, what's nice about what we're using now, um, I'll give you an example. Right now, our teachers are going to be inputting their f current Fontes and Pinal scores, um, and they just they get an email. Yep, please upload your scores. They click on it, it goes right to it, they put in all their scores, and then it, in real time, it's all updated. And we can see at a glance, at a classroom level, a grade level, a school level, exactly uh, the kids that we want to focus on based on what the teachers input. And it really is that easy. Yes? Is it easy and not time consuming? Is it easy and not so time they consuming? always had to input something somewhere, Linda, because in order for us to collect data and then use it, they had to fill in a spreadsheet, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. Courtney would send those out, or principals would work with, with them, um, and they would have to, you know, do the testing and then put them somewhere. They didn't just write them in a book, you know, yeah. those days are long gone. So they go somewhere, and then um, Courtney would have to then translate that data. Um, so that data teams and principals could really use it in usable ways. This uh, new system, which we're still learning and we'll still be training, really allows you to do that. Um, it, 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 they, he uses the term dashboard. So when you open it up, there's a dashboard of every student. And what's nice about it is we can keep adding to it. So we could we could input, we're just working on Fountains and Pinal right now and um, AMC, but we're gonna be adding other things to it. But you can look at like attendance, you can look at MCAS scores, you can put all of that on the same dashboard and, and get a glance of students, students in the whole, in the aggregate, or students specifically. It's, it's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask, um, so you said about the instructional coach, it was redundant because she was doing a lot of what this new yes. analytic mm -hmm. tool, tool does. So is that instructional coach working less hours or are her point four somewhere else? No, 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 she's working less hours. She's working point six in the district. And I don't know how to ask this. I it's not our realm. Has, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? And that, yeah, Mr. Quorum. And just that is the end of your presentation That's on it? the regular day cost center. So any questions on regular day cost center, this is the time to ask them. Uh, Jeffrey Quorum, Ridge Road. Could you bring up the, the staffing numbers? I guess I was noticing that the uh, elementary teacher numbers stayed the same at 101.4. And I thought with the, the new modulars at Birch Meadow that we were going to need another first grade teacher. So do we? Do you want me to answer that? Or do you want to? All right. So we're, we're, we are shifting some teachers around in the district, and it's based on some grades going down and some grades going up. OK. So there will be a, we don't need to add an elementary teacher. We're able to move teachers from one building to another. OK. And also, the uh, high school teachers went down by 0.5. I think I remember at the override, there was like one position that was sort of, we were going to do something with it, and then it turned out we wanted to do something else with the, um, what was it, the transition program coming back I was, in. I was just um, so are we losing half a teacher here? Or no, we, what we, are we, it was a shift in the personnel, so the teacher position was shifted to the Stepping Stones program. Okay. Any other questions? 
Anything from the committee? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. You're welcome. Oh, Dr. Stice is now going to. <laughs> I think we have one yes. late coming question. I'm if sorry. Oh, Dr. Dice. Okay. I'm sorry, you passed. It's all right. Nope. Okay. Yeah. We changed the slide. Go back to questions. Look, algorithm. I know how to work the clicker now. We're good. I'm sorry, we don't have to go back to a slide. My question was about um, on page 29, which is figure yep. 14. Sorry, I've got two different documents here. Um, and it was about the field trips going down by 28.6. $200. It's $200. That's $200. Yeah, yeah, $200. <laughs> it's, okay. It's, it's, it's a big percent, very small amount of money. Not to be mean. It's, that's, it it's was $200, yeah. And that is building based. So that is when the principals allocate their funding, they look at where they okay. are. So I typically would not shout, not to be on a 40 some odd million dollar budget i would not challenge a 200 dollar decrease okay in a it just sounded control. so big also mm. <laughs> get it, it thank you would it oh yeah, yeah, yeah. would it be Unless safe would like me to look no i don't need you to look at that <laughs> <laughs> but i think it might, and maybe our elementary principals could could chime in here too but some of our pto members could probably chime in here too my understanding is a lot of the the um, trans the field trips are covered by some of the PTO organizations with that regards is, to they are. that is correct. And this could be depending on busing needs or if we need any like that. But a lot of them can be are funded in other ways or they've shifted. To other and Dr. Was, Doherty, oh, I'm so sorry. It's it's safe to say overwhelmingly predominantly by PTOs. Yeah, yes. pretty much. Yes. And it's the elementary, point. especially yeah. yes. Dr. No, I was just going to say my concern was it's not reducing our field trips by no. such a big no. percentage. That's where my question was coming from. Hadn't done the math on the $200. <laughs> Thank you. We got to look at every nickel. I can't. Um, anything else before we move on to special education? Okay, I think we're ready, Dr. Stice. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're here really um, to talk about the Special Education Cost Center, which is the biggest part of student support, but student support really does encompass a lot. And one of the things I just really wanted to highlight as, as we think about what does a district do, um, I often try to tell people special education isn't a place. <laughs> you know, people say, that, oh, they go to special education. That it's not a place, it's really a foundation of good teaching and learning and how do we build and work together. And I can say in Reading, there is a tremendous um, power in people working together. Curriculum, special education, working with our data people, Gail, the building principals. We are really creating a, a place that we are coming together and working together to solve problems for students and families, which is really very nice. Um, so when we think about the um, student services, um, we do have a part-time director who is also a half-time team chair. She's here tonight, Allison. Um, she, we could not do this work without her. She has years of knowledge of the district and is very knowledgeable and just really helps guide this work as well as I cannot tell you, I'm, I'm fairly certain um, at least once a week someone tells me how lovely Anne Marie Foley is and that she is absolutely the best person to take a phone call from and I just like to acknowledge that because I do think it goes such a long way when people are calling and having questions and concerns and knowing they're going to get an answer and maybe it's not an answer in the moment but there will be someone getting back to them and the same goes for um, Denise Santoro, who works um, for us half time and Rise half time. She equally is very supportive and actually our eSped expert. Um, <laughs> so we really do rely on her a lot. This is a little bit like the Academy Awards. I'm afraid I'm going to forget to mention somebody. Um, I, I do need to tell you how um, phenomenal the team chairs. They are the majority of our department um, that is working with students and families to make sure everybody has what they need. They um, 
are very dedicated to the students and families and the staff in Reading. I can tell you last night I was texting with two of the team chairs on the phone this morning with a principal at seven o'clock and right before I came up here I was talking to a BCBA. They are losing sleep over the children of Reading and trying to figure things out. And I mean all the children in Reading. Part of their job is to go out and look at our out of district placements and monitor. They are spending time there. They are coming back and answering, asking really thoughtful questions. They're analyzing MCAS scores. All of our students are all of our students and it is really delightful and that really truly does go down to the teachers, the paras, the related service providers. Um, it's, it's really very amazing and I do think Reading is very lucky to have such a supportive and invested staff um, to provide that foundation. Um, as of January um, 3rd, there were 727 students um, in receiving special education with signed IEPs. Interestingly enough, I'm sure Mr. Wise is going to ask why at the beginning of the year we had almost the exact same number. Our numbers fluctuate tremendously. Um, we laugh with Gail all the time, like at 12 o'clock today, this is the number of students we had. Um, honestly, when we look at a school like Josh Eaton, for example, they've had 22 referrals this year. Um, and already we know that eight of those students qualified. And so that we are where our numbers are always adding and then students are coming off IEPs. That's why things go up and down um, so frequently. And um, I think that some of what we need to acknowledge is Reading has already received 145 referrals for initial evaluations this year. The largest being 38 from RISE, um, which we would expect. Um, and as Chris Kelly mentioned, we are working really hard with Kelly Boswick and um, our community partners in um, preschool to make sure that we have a continuum of service. I think maybe it bumped up our referrals a little bit, um, but I do think that one of the huge benefits is the data that we are collecting. We have a log, every team chair logs every referral they get. We keep track of was it a parent referral, a school referral, what were the timelines, was it um, a finding of special education, did they receive an IEP? So we're able to now analyze that data and see if there are trends that we need to address in what we are doing. Um, so now we're gonna get into more specifics unless you have questions about that. Uh, Mr. Weiss. You didn't talk about 504s. Yep. So. Um, we have done a lot of work with 504s already this year. Um, one of the things that um, we identified right away um, as we started this work was that we really needed to spend some time calibrating our process across schools and um, and um, throughout the grade levels. So one of the things we did, we invested some money with um, Michael Joyce, our student support attorney. We created a binder for um, how the process and procedures, we also updated the forms, made them online, and retrained people on eSped how to get them, um, uploaded so that there's consistent information. What we're really doing now in the 504 process, and I can't give you exact numbers, because we really are looking school by school. Principals have been out and sitting with Denise Santoro, going through saying, this student no longer needs a 504. Um, that was dropped, it just wasn't dropped from our record. So we are literally student by student making sure that we've either met on someone and they've been discharged or we've met on someone and continued. So I would assume in the next couple of months we'll have much um, stronger numbers um, that I can give you accurate data. The other thing we are doing across 504s and IEPs is making sure we're really doing thoughtful transitions, especially between elementary and middle, middle and high, and talking about how when the kids step in the first day of school in their new school, does everyone know what they need? 
Um, so that's been a big part of our process and we're cleaning up the data. So I'll be able to give you more accurate data later. Okay. All right. Um, so we're really focusing on, um, on students and families and building the capacity of our staff. There is amazing staff in Reading and we really want to collaborate um, with them and use their skills to really be transparent, improve our processes, and make sure we are doing what is within the state and federal regulations. And um, special ed is nothing if not data-driven and lots of acronyms and paperwork and timelines. And so a big piece that we've talked about here several times and um, at the CPAC is that we've just are in the process of finishing our tiered focus monitoring, TFM. That is, um, the state comes in and does it, but it's a requirement of the federal government. And really what they're doing is looking at our compliance with our timelines, that are we being thoughtful, are we getting back to people, what are we doing, and are we out of compliance? And so as part of that, they came this this week, last week, and spent two days with us going through file after file, looking at standards to see what we met and where we might need to do a little bit of support. Another piece of that was that they sent out parent surveys and there were approximately, at the time we met with them, and it could have changed the final number because the portal for the surveys was open a bit longer, but there was about 114 parent responses. Um, of those parent responses, uh, many of them praised RISE and the work that they do and how they enter students into the system. And also there were a couple of responses that really also praised the high school and how they had rigor and standards and really wanted to make sure that students were achieving the best they could. And so we are really grateful for that. And one of the things that um, we spent a lot of time, Allison and I, talking with um, Andrew McKenzie, the gentleman from the state who conducted the review, is um, the need to continue to foster partnerships with families so that we are working together collaboratively to make sure we are making the best decisions for students with that rigor in mind. Um, and he had some, some great insights. So we're very thankful that the parents were able to um, fill out the surveys. Um, one of the things he did note that is a huge kudos to the staff of Reading Public Schools is he said he could tell every single time um, a IEP was rejected or there was a question or a concern Reading staff responded mm -hmm. and he said that is not always the case and he really wanted to commend us for that um, he did make a joke that there was lots of papers in the files they were very big um, but it showed the dedication that staff had to really make sure they were being responsive as part of the law we are really working on having um, ambitious goals and challenging benchmarks that comes from a case called andrew f where they're really saying not only does it have to be individualized but you need to stretch the kids as far as you can and that was some of the responses we got from the surveys about the high school and the work that we're doing leading up to the high school which was really really good um, and that it's always just important to remember that this is such a hard place my friend Gail and I, she likes the consistent numbers and I live in a world of gray where things go up and down all the time uh, because we don't know what students are going to need or who moves in or what is going to happen. So we do a lot of projections, um, but it is really, truly um, student driven and team decision based. So some of the things that we've been doing is really putting in a lot of data collection. We've created um, 
a list of all students that are in all of the sub-separate programs in Reading, all of the students that receive learning support in Reading. And then we did projections for, all right, this is what we think we're going to have next year, so that when we sat down with, with Gail and John and the building leaders, we were able to say, this is what we think it looks like now. What do we need to do to base our staffing for next year? Um, and we could really make some educated guesses, and our hope is over time, we're going to be able to really look at trends. Um, we're doing a lot of work on aligning systems. Allison and I kind of joke that we take the show on the road. We've been out in a lot of schools talking to people so that we're really creating that common vocabulary and having people understand some of the changes we needed to make to our compliance so that we were in line with the state. Because we, our strategy really was for the TFM was to be as honest and transparent as possible. Here are the errors we've self-identified as needing support. Here's what we've already done about it. And so we're really hopeful when the state report comes out that's going to be reflected, that um, he talked about, Andrew um, from the state said, he really sees us more engaging in a, a continuous cycle of progress monitoring, which is what we all do as educators, versus corrective action. Um, there may be a few things, but he really noted that we are striving to make um, those corrections ourselves. We're also doing a lot um, with our program descriptions. We want to be thorough and get input from everybody. We've been doing surveys of the staff of our programs, in-program staff, and staff that may not necessarily know about the program, and asking them, so what do you know? Because that's going to help us drive our PD, and how do we need to build capacity? And we're asking the teachers in the programs, in learning centers, we're asking the psychologists, BCBAs, speech and language, OTPT, think about for the next five years, what do you really need to be the best you can be? We're also doing that with reading, which is a, a big issue. We need to make sure we are focusing on having the best um, interventions possible that really match the student needs. So we've been doing a lot of work this year. Part of the team chair's actual group goals is to analyze all of the students' data, which the help of Courtney, who is the data analyst, um, to look at all of the data for all of the students in Reading who receive pull-out reading services and really analyze where are they at? Are they making progress? Do we need to reconvene? What steps do we need to take to help that? And then knowing we're going to need some experts to come in to help grow our capacity. So someone like Dr. Orkin, who's a leader in brain research, having her come and talk about how do we assess children? What are the, the places we need to look at? And then if the student's really struggling in fluency, do we have the right fluency intervention? We don't want to be doing Wilson with a student who has just plain comprehension issues because we're not necessarily getting to the heart of the matter. So it's a really complex, and what we're trying to do is build in systems so that we can make projections about professional development, support, what else we need to do in order to meet the needs um, of everybody. Um, the other two things we've, we've also been doing with this staff as we think about our five-year plan is um, we've been doing workload indicators with the um, related service providers. Um, because um, I have a friend who used to tell me, it's not about counting warm noses. You can't just say to a speech and language pathologist, how many students do you see? That doesn't tell the story because there's a big difference between a student who may need um, social pragmatic instruction really intensively and a student who may need some articulation support for um, a short period of time. So we really need, we're using some of the recommended programs from like ASHA, that's the Speech and Language um, Pathologist Association, to help us really dive into what do we really need so we can make really calculated recommendations for all of you based on our actual out 
work output, and that also includes getting schedules from everybody. The special education teachers looking at how are our reading groups formed? Are there, are there ways we could regroup students that make more sense so that the students are getting the most out of the lessons and that the staff is making the most of their time? So that's a lot of the work that we've done. Questions about that? That was a lot. And I can talk fast. No? Okay. Um, so this really just talks about that we need to have a continuum of service and based on student needs. And, and that's really where our projections have come in handy so we can talk about what personnel we think we're going to need. And also our ability to really talk about what's in the best interest of, of students. We know that the research tells us the closer they are educated to their general education peers, the better the trajectory of their life. And for some kids, that's out of district, that's residential, that is as close as they can be, but we need to have the data to support it and we need to make sure we have tried everything, which is really um, part of the team process. So it really is this very highly individualized programming that our staffing needs to reflect. <coughs> Good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I think with, with this, when we look at this, um, it is really, again, a credit to the staff to be thoughtful about the number of students that we have in special education and what are we supporting them the right way. So there's a lot of internal work going on behind the scenes that, that we are building our own inter internal capacity. We are looking at our percentages of each disability compared to the state. Our, how are we coding students? What are we missing? Are there other supports these students need that we need to plan for in the future? Um, and, and then where do we fall with the state in terms of um, um, percentage of students with disabilities in our district. And so this, um, the state hasn't come out with their firm number, but the last time the um, commissioner said, he said about 18.3. So that's estimated at this point. Um, you can see that as of this report, there was a decrease in our out of district um, students. Um, several students graduated last year. We're actually anticipating that nine will graduate this year, which again is a huge credit to Reading that we are making sure all of our students are having those opportunities to graduate or age out into another program or place that they're going to be successful adults. Also, um, one of the great things is we've had three students return from out of district so far this year and there's a fourth that is actually um, really working hard to come back and he wants to come join the high school which is exciting and so those are the conversations we're continuing to have um, but again that number fluctuates and I think it's really important to remember Massachusetts is really the leader in the country in this and so there's a lot of rigor and a lot of push to make sure we are doing the right things and we're not only in compliance but we're thinking about our students and families and what they need and what's best for them and that we really do have a continuum of service and sometimes you don't even see a saving so for example if you've added a program for students with autism five years ago, we're not calculating the savings of our in-district program has now stopped all those students from going out of district. So there's almost like a hidden savings in just our good planning for students across the district. Any questions about that? I actually do. Yep. So how do you explain, if we've seen a decrease in the number of students and on IEPs and a significant decrease in out of district placements, I would almost expect the budget to have gone down and yet it's up 5%. So how do you explain that? So that's a great question. There's actually, um, there's a lot of cost increases that come with special education. We've this year alone had four 
of our private schools send us cost increases. Um, and so, and then every year, those out of district schools um, generally up their rates. And, and so, um, yep. our collaborative rates also happen to be going up over, over time. So, we need to just, that's what we need to budget for. And also, some of the students' needs are changing. So, we have a lot of kids in district that probably 15 years ago would have been out of district. But we also need to plan for, so how do they access the curriculum? What technology do they need to be in classrooms, be engaging, and be communicating? And so um, although the numbers of students don't necessarily add up, there's a lot of other factors in that. So great question. Thank you. So it sounds like a combination of increased costs that we don't control, like, like tuition, which they just announced. We've increased it whatever percentage, and I know it can be really significantly high. Crazy high. Right, yeah. so that we don't control, and then student need. The student exactly. need is more demanding, that's more costly. Okay. Exactly, and we also can have change in placements. So for example, we have a student who was at a private day school, needed more significant support, moves residentially, there's an increase in tuition, same student, um, you know. So, and, and um, different schools have different rates. If a student was at a collaborative but needed more support and moved to a private day school, there's an increase in tuition there as well. And so, with that being said, I, I do just really wanna give a shout out to Gail and her team and Chris, um, who sits in the back quietly. Um, he works very hard and very closely with Anne Marie Foley to really look they go student by student. They check attendance and transportation, and we have found errors this year alone in getting overcharged that we are able to correct, and that's really the due diligence of the staff working on that. Before you move to the next slide, I will ask if there are questions. I know how to go back. I think we're good. Thanks, Dr. Sides. Okay. And keep going. No problem. So you actually were the perfect lead-in to the next slide because that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, was you know we are a member of two collaboratives. Um, our superintendent sits on the boards of those collaboratives. We get a lot of benefits. Um, and I have to say, I was really excited. I went to a meeting today, and a lot of the work that we're doing in Reading is about evaluating our programs and creating a plan to make sure we are always making sure we are doing the right things and how do we look at it. And when I talked to the members of SEAM Collaborative, the other uh, special education directors and or student support people, they were actually willing to partner with us in that. That if we chose to say, you know, look at our language-based program or our TSP program, they would look at it the same year so we could then consolidate, could an expert come, tell us across this area what do we need and how can we make um, improvements and use each other, which I think is really exciting. So being at two collaboratives not only gives our students a wider range of options, it also gives our staff and family and, and our opportunity to build capacity. Um, and as I mentioned, we've had four cost increases this year alone. They do nicely send us a 30-day notice. <laughs> um, and they allow us to go. Um, I know uh, Shana, who's here tonight, is going to be going to one to here. Um, and although they do allow us to have public comment, it doesn't generally change the outcome of the cost increase. Um, and so those are things we are unpredicted and we have to really work and on. I think the other part that's a challenge is they're effective immediately. They do not, they don't give you, it's not that it's effective in the next fiscal year. If you get a hearing and the hearing is January 25th, it could be effective February 25th. That is the new rate. So that adds to the challenge that there isn't really a planning period. Right. Um, the other thing that we've talked about as a, as a group is that circuit breaker reimbursement for transportation. Um, over the next few weeks, we're told um, the collaboratives are going to be hosting a meeting um, with the state to really kind of start to roll out what that's going to look like. Um, today, they, the 
the people at SEAM indicated they're thinking that it may be reimbursement for students who already tripped the circuit breaker number, and then this would be an additional percentage of that. Um, and so it's going to be curious to see, well, what if a kid's really close to the foundation budget and transportation puts them over? Can we consider them? Those are going to be some of the questions. And um, I believe that myself, Gail, Dr. Doherty will be invited to this meeting with other um, partners at, at SEAM to really ask those hard questions. And then we'll see when they actually roll it out and what it looks like. So that's coming. Any questions about that? Um, oh, did I not? What I do? Oh, there's I'm one so in the sorry. audience. Miss Perry, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Paula Perry, member of FinCom. Um, and it's sort of going off what you were focused on. So I'm looking at the number of out of placement students in this current year is down, which is great. And I'm hearing a lot are gonna graduate, which will make me feel that number is not gonna dramatically go up next year. We never know, I get it. Correct, yep. But um, I can, really I can predict that there is going to be an increase <laughs> in that. Okay, but you wouldn't expect significant because you've got graduates? Um, so it's going to ebb and flow, and it, and it happens throughout the year. So that's where we're really talking very closely about what are those cost adjustments. But I know that there are a few kids where teams have made recommendations for extended evaluation assessments to see do they need to be out of district. So there are probably going to be, you know, this year, maybe six students that are going in and we don't know who's going to move in or how those needs are going to change it's very variable so it almost kind of works out a one for one in the end unfortunately right so the numbers you're showing for students is at this moment yeah. or I, at the moment it was published <laughs> that's exactly yes. right right <laughs> so how are we tracking now actual to budget for out of district tuition so this year we actually are tracking we need very more. well. We actually were very fortunate last year as part of the budget process that we were able to obtain additional funding that went towards the special education. So we are meeting, um, I just have to thank Anne Marie who just set up the every other week meetings. I don't know if I should thank her for that. Um, where we actually are going student by student and at this time of the year we're also looking at any potentials where recommendations may happen where agreements are being are up for renegoti renegotiation but right now we're comfortable with how we're trending and i know we did transfer monies last year so is that in the baseline that it we're is. seeing we okay. were I, I i'm just a little still staggered by the increase showing and that we've been experiencing with decreased and part of that also has to do with some of the changes that we have had in the placements or if additional monitors or transportation has been added so it really isn't always necessarily the app which is hard for an accountant to say the absolute number there's a lot of other day count in the school transportation to the school type of placement in the school and those are constantly changing where we've had some go from least restrictive to most restrictive and that can cost it could be a six-figure difference in the tuition in one student based upon a placement change. Yeah, or or their last Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I remember last year we spent a lot of time talking about w yeah. what a big swing it can be. But I'm just seeing enrollment numbers that are reflecting going down and then still such big increase. Yeah. It's staggering. Yeah. It's very uh, On scary. average, um, you know, we say it's like a 2.5, 2.7 increase every year. But there are placements that go up 5 10%. And if it's a big ticket one that goes up that much, and if the student there's needs also change. If a student needs a one-to-one, -one, it's the tuition plus the one-to-one -one para. And if the student has an extended day, that para is there for the extended time or the, the 
you know, the portion of the night that is the student's not asleep. There's lots of things that we can account for in terms of student need. So it really isn't like a one-to-one -one correspondence because it's so variable based and on I, the student. I think when you factor in the transportation, that's the other part that we spend a lot of time with our service providers, but that can fluctuate because if it's only one student on a route to the bus, you pay for the in basically the entire bus plus if there's a monitor so those numbers fluctuate depending the number of students on the route to the school day counts as well so it's yeah and I was just focused on the tu um, tuition uh, yeah. placement yeah. tuition that it's I think did I just see six percent or four percent now I'm already forgetting from walking from there to there and yet showing less students and it's yeah, it's the level of need. It's the level of need, really need and the yeah. type of placement that they have. And I will say, I know last year there was at least one school that had two, if not three, increases effective in the same year for the same school tuition base. Yeah. So it's scary. Yes, it is. It is. And I would add to that, just to add to that sort of variability, you might see a decrease in the number, but I remember in, in recent history, in the last couple of years, there was a year when after the budget was approved and closed and the fiscal year started, we had an increase of suddenly of, of rise preschoolers with very significant needs. Yes. Yes. And after the budget had closed and after the school year had started, we needed to hire a full-time um, teacher. To do, yeah. And it was so simply insane. because yeah. we got an, an unexpected number of, of yeah. three-year-olds with very high needs that nobody knew were coming and nobody predicted and it needed to be paid for. So that variability we've definitely seen over time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Why do I seem to be missing something? I skipped it. Um, so I think as we go forward um, with talking about this, um, I know at the other cost centers, we've already talked about the um, contractual cost of living increases. All right. You're on the wrong slide. I am totally on the wrong slide. There you go. Nope. Oh, we're not That's backwards. Fine. Going the wrong way. Yeah. I think it fell there, you go. there you go. There we go. I really wasn't even touching it. I don't know what I did. <laughs> um, and so, um, so this really just talks about that cost of living adjustments. And we know in terms of the union contracts that were in the, the final year, so that's a number we know. And then for the non-represented personnel, we are also looking at a cost of living adjustment. Um, so some of the things that we've really kind of already talked about this um, with our uh, special ed um, tuition increases and transportation costs and what that really amounts to. Um, it, we do show a decrease in tuition in our revolving count offset for students that we're tuitioning in. However, I think it's really important when we dig into the data to know that, um, for example, right now we have two students tuitioned in. One of them's graduating next year. Um, one of the students that was tuitioning in, the family actually moved to Reading. And the other piece of, of data that's important to know is we've had four requests from other communities. We are constantly talking about who might fit. But that's also really, we need to be careful because we don't want to give a slot away that we're anticipating a Reading student is going yeah. to need. And we want to make sure those children are the right match. Um, and so we'll continue to really work on building our capacity to tuition students in, but we want to make sure we're doing it in a way that's supportive of Reading students and staff to make sure that students are being serviced appropriately. Um, I think the other thing that is really important is, um, Gail mentioned this last week, that we're going to be looking at the rise tuition rates and making sure that they are equitable, but that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of research around what are like communities doing, how are we making this support. And um, so we're going to be doing that over the next year with Gail um, in rise 
throughout the other cost centers as well. So that it's going to be a very thoughtful process. And I know that we've talked about this several times, but just to reiterate, there is a small grant, um, the 262 grant. We have a staff member on it. And the focus of preschool is really to provide inclusion opportunities for our three-year-olds with special needs. And that is, that is why we have preschool, is to support those students and provide them with typical learning experiences and peers that can help them to grow because we know the earlier they, we are able to intervene, the more ready all students are going to be for their kindergarten experience and have a really good kickoff all the way through the graduate. So, um, so those are some of that's a continuation of some of the work we're going to be doing. Okay, um, on this slide. It seems like I have more slides than Kristen. Yeah, <laughs> You're not um, just smaller. <laughs> um, we talked about with Jen Allard uh, earlier in the year that a few of these increases were listed um, because we had to add them at the beginning of the year when we had staffing changes. We weren't able to predict a program need and we had to make sure we were staffing the classrooms appropriately. So some of those, although their additions to this budget actually happened this school year. Um, we were also, we did a slight increase to one of our physical therapist because there was an increase in caseloads and we wanted to really work on her compliance. One of the other things we really did that builds capacity in this district, um, and actually we were commended at the TFM for it, was that um, we had um, an occupational therapy assistant CODA, who also became certified as an AT specialist, assistive technology, and we were able to hire her um, to do some assistive technology work where we've contracted that service out in the past. And that was one of the um, kind of secret focus areas of the TFM that we didn't know they were going to ask us about. And they commended us for being really forethinking in terms of building our own internal capacity instead of having to contract out and we still have excellent relationships with our community partners that provide that service they're helping us mentor this person so that we're growing our capacity um, but one of the things that we've seen a great impact on is um, this person's actually been going out to schools and doing workshops for staff around the technology that's available. So not only is she working directly with students and doing evaluations, but she's building capacity as we go, which is, is really good and where we want to continue to grow ourselves so that students are getting what they need because they need it not because we're necessarily waiting for an evaluation to tell us. She's able to go into program classes and say, let's add these things and make sure all students have access to it, which is really exciting. Um, the other addition to um, the special education support is a point for occupational therapy uh, therapist and a 0.6 speech and language pathologist maybe an SLPA depending on um, the staffing piece but what we know is there's been an increased need for services and evaluations when we're talking about you know 38 evaluations at the preschool level almost all of them have speech and language and occupational therapy and we want to make sure the evals are thorough and complete but we also want to make sure all students are getting serviced at the same time and so that's where as i think about projections and data for you as we move forward that's where those workload indicators come into play and really are going to help us define those needs. And so this is a great step in the right direction to make sure we're building capacity and meeting those real student needs um, that are driven by the IEPs. Questions about those individual positions? Um, yes, thank you. Um, the assistive technology. It's, yeah. it's great to hear that she, he is going into the schools, she is going into the schools, and then potentially adding in, even maybe where something's not on an IEP. However, 
Or is it then being used by that student theoretically and, and that student may build a dependency or not a dependency but a need? It's, it actually is helping them achieve their goals, right? Achieve the growth that they need to see. Yeah. If it's not on their IEP and the test comes around, they can't use it. So are we using that to then say, let's go back to the IEP and say this was something that helped them and is necessary for them to make the progress, therefore, let's Absolutely. document it appropriately. Yes, but there are certain things that are just great um, technology tools that can be used. So I, I'm going to fully admit, I sat there very cool. Although the one that like predicts your age, I thought was a little off. Yeah, because there's one that it <laughs> you actually. Were you were 20. Uh, it was good. 20. <laughs> um, it's for it sight impaired. impaired. So it takes a picture of you and tells like descriptors. of. The so for a student, for example, age. who has difficulty reading people's emotions, it's a way to say that person looks angry. And we can use it as a teaching tool. Um, but there's another tool that is really good, and we've talked about really using it across the district, and my daughter actually uses it in college, where you can just take a picture of the whiteboard and it converts it into text. And so for my daughter who is dyslexic and struggles to read the teacher's notes all the time, it now becomes into um, typewritten text that she's able to go in at home. Um, and so there's lots of things that are just going to make things easier for kids that we should give everybody access to. And then if particular students need it in order to be successful, it's going to go into their IEPs. We're not replacing the evaluation process and, and that IEP-driven process. We're enhancing our programming just to make sure that we're not waiting for a student to struggle to say, let's do an eval. We're saying, hey, I bet this might work for you. Let's try it out. If it is what you need, let's just add it in. I love the proactive approach. I, I, don't, I don't mean to say anything other than that, right? I just want yeah. to make sure that if it's there and it's they, they get that dependency to a degree that it is then codified as appropriately. Yeah, in absolutely. As well. And I think the other piece that for us having an in-district person Technology changes so fast, we really need someone who can help us keep up with that so that we're not waiting for an eval of a student to go, oh, we didn't know there was a later version of that. So I really do think it's, um, it's a real kudos to the district for being proactive about that last year. Uh, let's see. Um, so when I think about our, our legal services, it's really important to know that they do much more than just preparing for hearings and consulting on special education. They really do a lot of training for us on 504s. They help us with suspensions, student records. They're really building our capacity. And, um, I would love to tell you I have a goal. I really do have a goal. I'm not sure we're going to meet it yet, but I know we're going to get there. We really we need to reduce our attorney fees in the, in the area of hearings because hearings are really um, telling us that there's a, a, a communication breakdown somewhere and we're relying on other people to help us resolve it. And so as we build our capacity, we build trust and partnerships with parents, I would much rather be shifting the money we're spending for attorneys to focus on the teaching and learning and making sure that we're really doing the right thing and partnering to support students. Um, but then we can also use that to be proactive again provide trainings, making sure we're not having procedural errors, making sure that we are really tight. If a kid, um, if there's a student who's struggling and, and maybe needs a disciplinary action, that we know exactly how to go through the manifestation process or what paperwork goes with a short-term suspension versus um, an emergency removal. That's where we really need to get to. So it's, it's a dual, um, process. We need to develop, continue to develop our relationships with students and families so that we are really working together to, to provide for students and not having that breakdown, but then we can also continue to really build our capacity. 
Any questions about that? So on, on this slide, um, you can see where our cost centers are and where the increase is. I think some of the highlights are knowing that other salaries really um, are paraprofessionals, extended year paraprofessionals. We're constantly planning to make sure that we are supporting the students' individual needs. Um, I'd also like to highlight where it says other expenses. That's a big piece of that is our out of district. Um, our software, our um, PD is about $18,000 there. Um, we also pay our collaborative dues. And um, this year we funded the CPAC's um, mass pack dues and we'll, we are really hoping to be able to continue to do that because that's what funded Leslie Leslie coming to do that training. It affords our CPAC to continue to grow in support. So we wanna make sure we have that funding to pay some of those dues to continue to build our capacity. Any questions about that yeah, slide? Mr. Yeah, um, so can you talk a little bit about the story with extended school year, uh, yep. extended year where it's going up 15%, probably a good thing, probably tied to IEPs, but can you explain a little bit about that? Yep, so that's exactly um, what it is. We're really looking at our staffing. So for those people who don't know, extended school year is IEP driven. It's students that have regression um, during the school year. If they had summer off, there would be more than typical regression. And there's also an issue with recoupment. Their skills don't come back as quickly. So we need to provide services so that they don't demonstrate that regression and really fall behind. Um, Allison Wright actually coordinates it as part of her position and runs it. And so because these tend to be our most needy students, we also have that increased need in staffing um, that we see and so we're really trying to be proactive and make sure that we are budgeting um, in accordance because we also need speech and language pathologists OTs and the people to support with those related services and just to add on to that I think one of the items that I wanted to also point out is that even though it does look like a significant increase from the budget the current year actuals exceeded the budget. So we also looked at the staffing of the current year and the teachers that are part of the ESY program, it's their contractual rate, which does go up each year as well. So there's a built-in increase. And then we looked at where we came in this year, worked with um, Jen and Allison to look at what we thought might be for next year. But one of the items we did budget at about 90,000 for this year, actuals came in at 103. So I knew at a minimum that I would need to increase it to reflect current year actuals, contractual increases, as well as student needs. So I just wanted to at least point out that we did under budget it slightly in the current year. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you, so this is the special ed side of the, uh, special education side of the budget. Extended school year covers other things potentially too. Um, ELL, no. you know, Title I reading or anything else like that? No. That's all regular day. That's all. Regular That's me. Day. Or grant. But is there, there's a more extended school year budget elsewhere? I didn't see it necessarily. So, <clears throat> we, so that comes out of grant money. So um, <coughs> we have two cost centers that we can use for that. We are part of a collaborative uh, with the Title III grant that we, we do with other districts. So we should be able to provide some EL um, summer services, some tutoring. Not a lot, but some. Um, we're also doing um, some after school tutoring out of that grant as well. Um, and in addition, Title I, we, we hope to have some summer program programming. As I said to you at the CPAC the meeting the other night, that's really contingent on how much we have left. Um, currently, we use our Title I funding. Because we're not a Title I district, we're a Title I targeted assistance district uh, because we don't meet the threshold of um, economically disadvantaged for a district. We earmark our, our funds to kill them and um, Josh Wheaton currently. Um, so they are, they are allowed additional tutoring, parent engagement, and extended services. So uh, those look different at both schools. Primarily, it's staffing, um, and we pay tutors for that. 
Um, so we'll see how much money we have and how much we can carry into the summer. The, the problem with the grants is although we apply for the grants, they don't kick in until after the summer. So it, we, can ca we can carry over some of our, fun our money. So it, it's a delicate balance. Um, Gail and her team will work closely with me to make sure that we can do that. Um, we also have to have the staffing to provide it. So it, uh, the two principals from those two schools will definitely work. And then, you know, we'll continue to look at are those the schools we want to continue to earmark money or, you know, are we going to look at expanding that, moving it around? The um, federal government gives us a little bit of autonomy, but we have to look at our echo disk as well as our free and reduced numbers at each school to make those determinations, and that's done annually. Dr. Doxer? Um, I think my question is just sort of a um, an affirmation of what I'm hearing. I'm in awe of how you juggle the fluctuations and the unpredictability of of our students' needs. It's sort of an exclamation point beside our students aren't widgets. Mm. They're not widgets in regular day, they're not widgets in special ed when they sure. have special needs. Um, and I love what you were saying about the importance of relationships in order to lower the need of hearings and raise the inclination to working together and learning together and being on the journey together, to, to steal a, a phrase, towards meeting the specialized needs. And so knowing that relationships take bandwidth that is not necessarily calculable in, in numbers. numbers, in money, my question is, do you feel like this budget, and, and also emphasizing that you said it goes across reg ed and sped ed because our, our teachers are working across those lines. Right. They work together. So do you feel like <coughs> the budget where it's at is enabling you to have that bandwidth to, to do this? So I think asking that question of any of us, we, we could always show you where there's more need, right? Um, and, I, and I know that, you know, when we, we talk about salaries and what's equitable and what's like across different districts, what I can tell you about this budget is it's very thoughtful and it's data driven. And my goal is to be able to continue to give you the data because I, I would predict that, that our speech and language pathologists, our OTs, if we're looking at their schedules over time, the need for them is probably bigger than what we have right now. I really feel like it's my responsibility um, as a member of this administration to collect the data to help you give, uh, to give you the, the data that can show you that this is really why we need it and where we need it and how to build over the next five years. So when I'm talking to the staff about what do we do for the next five years in terms of PD, I want to get to the granular level. We need so many people trained in Orton Gillingham. We need so many people trained in Wilson. How are we going to do that? I love the idea of partnering with our SEAM our SEAM cohorts to say way cheaper to hire one Wilson trainer to do all of our districts and over each year can we do so many? This is a long process and I think that we just need to continue to know that we've got to build that bandwidth and we've got to honor the people that are here and the work they do so that we can um, continue to keep the really good people we have mm -hmm. so that we're building those relationships over time. I actually have a couple of questions. So I know that there are a couple, some amount of FTE increases and they're, they're largely made up of 0.3 here, 0.4 here, so yeah. they're not positions, they're more increased need that need a little bit more time. And a significant percent portion of them are already in this year's budgets. They were needs. So I just wanted to confirm for the record that you found that money within this year's existing budget. Mm -hmm. So just wanted yeah. to say that. I have two questions on, it's in the detailed budget, on page 36, figure 19. Um, and they're just around lines, they're small dollar amount full disclosure, but the lines that look a little weird, and I'm guessing there's an explanation. So the first one is psychological services at the top of the page. It seems like in the past that was sort of in the tens of thousands of dollars, then we budgeted barely any money last year, and now we're adding a little bit of money. I'm just 
Sorry, which the oh, psychologist? <coughs> Psycholo it's, it's the first line, eighty five hundred. Top of page thirty six. It's at five hundred fifty three. Oh, my page numbers might be different. And it's more the historical, you know, it's like twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a few years, then it drops to practically nothing. And it's still a very low number, but it's not what it was. Gail's thirty six oh, doesn't look like your thirty six. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, figure, so, figure nineteen, Gail. Yeah, figure nineteen. That's why I was like, why am I not Oh, I know what we did. We shifted funding around between. You moved it some, from somewhere else. So we have looked at all of the various line items within there. And so for psychological services, we looked at historically where we had been. And we have basically looked at all of the various line items and shifted the budget to where we historically have been spending it to avoid having to just do budget transfers during the year. So it was a net no impact. We just moved funding amongst different line items to get it to where we historically to a more appropriate place. place. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it easier in our process. That way, we're not constantly doing budget transfers once we incur the services. So we've spent a lot of time looking at where we think we are this year, where we think we're going to be next year, and getting the money in the right line item, which is what I've been attempting to do over the past. Yeah, we've seen something like that before. Is the pupil transportation several lines almost towards the bottom? It's probably a similar thing. The it went from tens of thousands to just a couple hundred dollars. I'm guessing it's the same instances story. instances in which we have, um, there are multiple ways to do the transportation. One of the ways is parent reimbursement. So that is an instance where we just do not have as many situations of reimbursing parents. Okay, so that's a legitimate change. It's a legitimate yeah. change. Oh, okay. Is a, as of as of whatever day we cut the budget, we knew. <laughs> I can also add that I asked that same question, Jean, about the psych services at one of our uh, internal meetings. And if you look at the testing and assessment line, that was significantly cut. Mm -hmm. That had formally been put, a lot of that had been put there. But because it's specifically psychological, it was moved into that other line item. So we, we already had asked the same question. Thank you. So well, good to know. Great minds. Mr. Weiss. Just keeping on that same table, it seems interesting, maybe odd to me, that we don't budget at all for substitutes in the special education district. <laughs> um, we actually do. It's a little bit of a geography. There's factored within the paraprofessional line item. So typically we will have, oftentimes, depending on what type of coverage it is, it may be paraprofessionals that are covering. Typically, where you see the, the teacher substitutes, that might be a longer term covering for a leave of absence that we have. And sometimes it'll be covered via salary savings if the person's on unpaid leave. But we do have dollar amounts budgeted within the paraprofessional line, because that's typically where we tend to fund that out of. Any other Any questions? Other questions? Okay. So on, on this line item, I think one of the things that, that you may ask that seems to stand out is the reduction in the BCBAs, but the increase in the team chairs. And the reason that you're seeing that is, is it's still the exact same amount of staff. We just switched the funding source uh, because of the retirement. So a team chair pays into the retirement, and by putting a team chair salary on our big IDEA grant, we're paying that. We pulled one of the team chairs off and put a, um, a BCB, BCBA on. Uh, because they don't have that cost center. So it actually gives us a little bit of savings that we can then put into PD or direct student services versus retirement. So there's no change of staffing in either of those. Right. They right. Just, moved where they <laughs> just grant funding. And grant, it was just a shift of two positions. We are finding, especially in all of the special education related grants, which topic for another day because it's always a pleasant one, the concept of proportionate share. As that number becomes potentially larger and larger, we are looking for ways to preserve as much of the funding that comes to us as yeah. possible. So making these subtle changes can make a difference because it can free up 
a decent enough amount of money by switching the positions that we're able to not have to take away in order to fund the proportionate share. So it's a very time consuming but well thought out plan as we're looking at who's going on and making sure within the requirements of the grant to supplant. Uh, no, supplement, supplement not, not supplant. supplant. <laughs> So we, there are many different rules. We can all we quote that follow, quick. But where I always say those two backwards. But we're always trying to make sure we're preserving as much of the funding as we can. So that's one of the items that Jen and I will be doing this year when we go through the renewal process is really to look at every item we're putting on the grant to make sure it, it works as well as it can. And one of the interesting things, for those people who don't know, proportionate share is a regulation where we're required to offer services through a service plan for students who either are homeschooled or privately schooled um, that have special education needs. And it's a, um, an interesting process because Massachusetts um, has some different regulations on how to implement it than the feds do. Um, and so we have to really balance that and make sure that we're giving equal opportunity. Um, and so one of the interesting things that I would anticipate maybe a question is that there's some money that had rolled over in the IDEA grant. That is the proportionate share money that um, one of our, our private school partners, it is their money. We cannot spend it. We need to work with them to support the students that are at that school with special needs. Um, and we've been working hard to try to engage them in the process. Um, and so we're working on it and we're working with the state to try to figure out how we can spend that money and support our, our students. That, and interestingly enough, it's students that go to school in Reading. They may not live in Reading, but if you go to school in Reading, you are entitled to some of that money. It could be its own discussion. It's very <laughs> complicated, um, you know, regulatory driven. Um, but um, that's one of the reasons why there's this, this carryover. It's because it's actually not our money to spend. It's our money to help support this other population of students. Mr. We had a very lively discussion when it first came out. I want to say two years ago. <laughs> oh, no, I might have opened up a can of worms. No, I was no, just I, trying I to see, explain. I could, I could see where Mr. Wise was going. I'm like, I might have to pull up. No, I just want to make sure I got the hint that you just said, and I'm just going to yep. peel the, the Band-Aid right off. Go there. right ahead. You're telling us that schools aren't responding to you when you're trying to ask them for help? When you are trying to say we, no, can help you. we continue you're... to engage with we continue to engage them, I think is what and she they said. Will not they're not responding. <laughs> so I've I've had two I've had two meetings and we received an email saying thank you very much, but at this point we're not willing to um, okay. we're we don't have the bandwidth to the same engage regulations are, are are with a consolidated grant to my side too. I will say and we can't free that money back up if they decline it. Enough. It is technically not ours or we have to spend it for that purpose. I will say, for, fortunately, the title money tends to be a lot easier because it's more professional development driven, and the schools are always willing to send people. And they they do so usually partake of that. that. Yeah, that gets spent down pretty quick. This, because they can't determine where it goes, they don't have access to the money. It comes through us. We spend it. That it's it. it this one's a lot more challenging for us to manage. However, I do want to say there's. Um, both the IDEA grant and the 262 grant have this proportionate share clause. We have worked extraordinarily well with our community partners um, at the preschool level to spend that money. The group yes. There, there is no money there. We've no, written no. service plans. We have really done that. This is they for jumped right on it. the yeah. older the um, people. IDEA yeah. Yeah. Darn it. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Sorry. Doctor. So what happens at the end of our fiscal year if they have not enabled us to spend to their the money, money on those students? We have the ability to carry the funds over. I will say this is the interesting part that I think a lot of people are waiting for that exact answer because the federal government, the state does not want you to give the money back because then they have to give the money back to the federal government. So they basically come and say we, you need to kind of work with it to figure it out because we don't want the money back and then it can impact future funding. 
but from an audit standpoint, we have to spend it where it's supposed to be spent. So we're spending a lot of time with Jesse to say, how does this actually play out if we're not able to? There's another concept which we want to be very careful is if you don't spend it in the current year, it can become additive. So if I take the money this year and say, we weren't able to do it, it in theory could get added to your future. So you could end up just compiling the amount of money going forward. It's, it's relatively new, and so there's still a lot of work being done on how do you get some of them to be more engaged. I have to <laughs> imagine we're not the only community in this. Oh, yeah. no. So the good news no. is at the state level, <laughs> they should be working through yes. no, 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 this process. process. A lot of the grant conferences that people are just Federal saying, driven. Yeah. We, we don't know what to do. Some communities have great, they've had great involvement in responses and others it's just taking a little bit longer and, and honestly there there was a um, actual lawsuits yeah. to get this money from um, primarily religious schools were saying we're not getting what we're supposed to have so so it's really this fine line as we're all trying to figure it out some people really want to engage in it and want the money others are are more hesitant because it does require meeting with us going through data meeting with families and if they don't have the bandwidth at this point to engage then what do we do? So we're working together to try to figure it out. But I just wanted to identify that we know that <coughs> money is there and we're trying to figure out thoughtfully how to work with our partners. Dr. Doxer. I, I think, thank you. I think part of what bothers me the most about this is that you also have an incredibly stretched band, full bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. And that this adds on to that. Mm -hmm. And I almost wish that, I'm, I'm just going to say my wish, that there were, you were able to put that in a revolving account or some kind of account that was just designated for that. And when they take advantage of it, then they do. And then you're not spending your time spinning your wheels, but their student potentially is gonna graduate out because it's directed to a particular student, correct? It is, it's based on numbers. So we are trying very hard, we actually, as part of our grant, it's a very complicated process. Um, and, and I think we've done a, a much better job of collecting data on who are students that are homeschooled or private school that um, have IEPs and, and would qualify for this service. And that's, it's a percentage of that number, number. that um, di dictates the money. And because of these are federal funds, it, it it cannot be in a revolving account because it's not our money. It's technically the federal government's money, and if you spend it, you spend it, and if you don't, it goes back at the end of the branch period. So it, the two concepts are not commingleable. Thank you. Any other questions from work. the committee? Any questions? And this, I think we're done for Those the moment. Are. Oh, no, no, I'm definitely going to let you have your question. But I, oh. I do think <laughs> after this, we're done for the evening. So this, yes. Yeah. this, um, yes. we will be adjourning when we're done with this discussion. So yes, by all means. Hi, um, Laura Noonan, Pennsylvania Avenue. My question goes back to the swap and funding with the PCBA and the team chair. And my question is, if you take the funding away from the BCBA and you go from having two BCBAs per district to only having one BCBA per district, is that how, is that what's happening or am I reading it wrong? No, it's very confusing. Okay. So we actually have the exact same number of BCBAs and team chairs. We just switched the funding source. So there are still two BCBAs, one's on the local budget, one's on the grant. Okay, then I have no follow-up questions. There That's you go. All right. oh, we God. love our BCBA, so that was good. I, I actually do have a follow-up based on that question. Um, I, just to clarify, so the, the staffing hasn't changed. Is there any impact on responsibilities, roles, or the work that's being done? So no. it really is just, just an accounting thing. The only yes. change and they get paid the same way. The BCBA signs a cert saying she understands she's funded via the grant, and the team chair does not. So that is the only change Great. to that one individual, but no. Okay. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, um, I will get, I'll get ready to hear a motion to adjourn. I'd like to take a moment to thank Dr. Doherty and Ms. Kelly and Dr. Styes. That was a thoroughly deep presentation. Um, I know- And Mrs. Doe. 
I'm, I'm getting. <laughs> She's our foundation. <laughs> Settle in. I have some stuff to say. Um, no, I really do want to thank you. That was a really thorough presentation from both of you. And I think providing the color and the context of all the work that's going on is actually helpful in digesting the budget numbers. So thank you for the enormous amount of work that you did. And I do want to acknowledge all of the staff that are in the room Yay. yet again on a weeknight yeah, awesome. when you're going to be up early at school tomorrow. So thank you for coming in and all the work that you did in this process. And I will say a moment about Ms. Dowd. I think that you have one of the least appreciated positions in a school because no one's ever going to write you a note saying thank you for changing my life. But even that little detail about swapping out how two different positions are funded saved us money. And that money goes to the technology, to the curriculum. And I know for a fact, we hear it in these meetings all the time, but I know for a fact behind the scenes, I think that your skill, your work ethic, and your commitment to our students has an absolute impact on the quality of education. And since we're in budget season, I wanted to acknowledge that you have a very big impact on our students and to thank you for it. Um, with that. I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wise moves to adjourn. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Kelly seconds. All those in favor. All right. They were.